important. Please welcome Mr. Gurcharan Das and Mr. Mehmood Faruqi. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much for joining us. I think I'm going to start with a fairly fundamental definitional sort of question, which is um, who we talk about when we talk about the elite, because I am aware that there's no sort of monolith um, when we, we talk about the elite. And it's a, it's a sort of complicated uh, question of who is elite and the definitions keep shifting. And I thought before I do that, I might just for context, uh, and just to kind of make people aware of the fact that this is not something that we're merely discussing today, uh, quote uh, Gandhiji uh, from his uh, iconic speech at the Banaras Hindu University, where he defined the elite as foreigners in their own country, and I quote, we should have today a free India, we should have our educated men, not as they were foreigners in their own land, but speaking to the heart of the nation. They would be working amongst the poorest of the poor, and whatever they would have gained during these 50 years would be a heritage for the nation. Today, even our wives are not the sharers in our best thought. Look at Professor Bose and Professor Ray and their brilliant researchers. Is it not a shame that their researchers are not the common property of the masses? I'd like to begin by asking you, Mr. Das, how would you define the elite for your purposes? Well, let me first say, it's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, I, this is not the first time I'm speaking for algebra. Uh, you guys are a class act. And so let me just say, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be. Secondly, I think you've chosen the, oh God. So um, you've chosen the right subject because the word elite comes from the Latin, which means the elected. So today we've all had an election, and so it's, a, it's the right time to be, you, you know, your timing is good. And uh, third, of course, the question is that you have the political elite, which is about power. You have the economic elite, which is about money. You've got the social elite, which is about birth, and you've got the intellectual elite, which is about knowledge, which is wisdom, talent, and of course, this was the elite that Plato had in mind would actually be the best qualified to run a country. Plato had this idea that <clears throat> you'd have a philosopher king, and you'd have a meritocracy under it, and the meritocracy would be the talented who would work selflessly trained and work selflessly for the good of the state. And, and China actually tried that. I mean, this is a long answer to your question. But China actually, from about that 11th century, uh, has had a meritocracy right up to 19, 20, 1905, 1911, 1911. And it's an amazing record. And in a sense, China's success today, I'm sorry, we are <laughs> going <laughs> far afield from your quick question, but China, China today actually delivers a better, better governance but a better welfare for the poorest Chinese than democratic India does. Now, this is not to suggest that we should adopt the Chinese model, not, not by any chance. But we, don't, we, we should remember this, that China actually delivers to the poorest Chinese. And that's why we should ask ourselves, why should India be a democracy? We are so proud of our democracy. But when an, a totalitarian dictatorship is delivering a better deal for the poorest Chinese, why shouldn't an Indian want to be Chinese? 
<laughs> That's very interesting because you've not just touched upon the question of who is the elite, you've also touched upon the complex uh, definition of democracy because, you know, uh, elected elections don't translate to accountability and so on and so forth. But before we move on to all of that, elite, quick thoughts. Yeah, who yeah. Is so, the elite? so just, just to, because, you know, it's, uh, China delivers to everyone, you know, but it's a simple maxim also that man does not live by bread alone, you know. So it's a moot point whether you say to everyone that I'll bind your hands and your feet and I'll give you every day daily food to eat and people will be happy with that. Just, just, just to... Go just but governance, just I was talking Governance, about. Yes, not, not, not money. No, no. no I'm no. talking about day to predictability of your life. So, so democracy... As you walk out of your home. Correct, correct, correct. Absolutely, you're absolutely right yeah. about that. Even the USSR could deliver a lot of things, you know, in terms of the military industrial complex to its people, to its nation at least, you know. So there is a possibility of a strong unitary authoritarian government delivering to its people which does not which is which is much more cumbersome in democracy we've seen singapore do it we've seen korea do it we've seen to a certain extent malaysia and indonesia do it so authoritarian governments to a certain extent are able to deliver some services to the people but we are wearing a little bit further from where we started from you know so it was it is it was much easier to answer the question who the elite is until about 1990-95, exactly the time when Mr. Gurucharanda's book, India Unbound, came out, you know. Because it was very clear that there is an intelligentsia, you know, which, you know, people who re write and read in the newspapers, people who write books, people who are in the bureaucracy. So there was a Savarna elite, so to say, which was, you know, mostly upper caste, upper class. The businessmen were generally, by and large, looked down upon. The bureaucrats, the writers, the artists ruled the roost. But since about 2000 or so, when, you know, when the economy took off and there was a lot of money, a lot of people who earlier had financial capital but which was not converted into social capital or cultural capital are now able to do that. So in that sense, we are now a more democratic country even in terms of our elite. Our elite was earlier, you know, people born to a certain, ex, uh, you know, families, certain castes, certain classes, and then reproduced. Now a lot of new people have come into that elite. So it's difficult to say that, you know, somebody who's living in, you know, sort of a French colony and going to IIM is an elite, and somebody who lives in Punjabi Bagh and has a three-story house, you know, which is a lot of money, because they're also coming to your house, Khas village now, you know. So it's no longer the preserve. And they're also coming to your Khan market now. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer the preserve of, you know, the South Delhi, you know, D North Campus going people. In fact, the diminution of importance of North Campus in itself is a sign of an opening up of an elite. So there is a, now a much more democratic elite, an elite which is less invested in those ideas of leadership of India. The earlier elite carried this idea that they are, you know, sort of sons of India, sort of in a sense, Nehru's children. The idea that they are, you know, a product of a newly decolonized nation which is marching in a kind of a certain direction of progress. The contemporary elite in India does not, can, does not carry those burdens. It has sort of freed itself from its moorings in history and has also freed itself from let us say, you know, the Savarna burden, you know, it was the white man's burden to colonize India and it was then, you know, the burden of a certain kinds of people to carry India forward. The people who went to Oxford and came back to join the civil service, the people who went to Oxford and came back and chose to teach in, say, Stephen's College, you know. That sort of thing does not really carry the kind of cultural capital that it used to do about 20 years earlier. So, it's a difficult question to now answer whether the elites have failed our democracy. Because you see, it's not the d democracy, corporates, politics, these are not compartments, you know. When Mr. Naveen Chawla is talking about, you know, politicians using, you know, 30, 40 um, helicopters, who is running those helicopters? It's the corporates who are running those helicopters. Who are the CAs that he was talking about? Who are the lawyers that he was talking about? So the corporates and democracy and politics are all enmeshed together, and especially with the kind of capitalism that we have seen in, in, in the last uh, 20 years. I mean, a very famous industrialist of India famously said in the Radia tapes, Ki Congress to hamari dukan hai. So after we've had that situation, you know, it really talking about regime change with a sense that, you know, if a regime changes in political power, you know, heavens are gonna come falling down is something that we need to pause and think about. So I would say, I don't think our elites have failed democracy. I mean, they have not turned their backs on democracy. They are invested in that process because politics is a root of mobilization. 
and politics is the route through which you make money in the short term. You cut corners. So if you're talking about the financial elites, they are very much invested in this politics and democracy because this is how they will get their returns. So, so I don't think they have, you know, turned their backs on this democracy or politics at all. Okay, um, I'm just going to, uh, you know, obviously this is, this is because democracy can be defined 500 ways, elite can be defined in 500 ways, we all have complex identities. Um, and of course, even failing can be defined in so many different ways, right? So what I'm going to do, over the next, the couple of next, you know, uh, uh, 20, 30 odd minutes that I have, instead of asking if it's all right with the two of you, instead of asking you questions, I'm going to give you moot points and ask you whether you agree or disagree and why. Well, that's uh, true, but you know, Mr. Mr. Das has written seven, you know, seven, eight odd books, you know. I only have one or two books, you know. If you give us moot points, he'll have, you know, book length answers to give, you know. <laughs> well, we'll see about that, but... Um, I'll, I'll, I, I won't do that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're, you're too nice a guy. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, and uh, just a caveat, whatever the moot points that I present to them, they're not necessarily statements that I agree with. They're intended to be provocative statements, so um, please take them in that spirit, though there are some of them that I do agree with. Um, okay, so starting with now, uh, you know, you spoke about democracy and we spoke about elections and you uh, said something that reminded me of a wonderful miners song, uh, Bread and Roses. Mm -hmm. um, but Fortunately or unfortunately, the first thing that comes to mind when people say democracy is elections, whether we like it or not, and we're in the middle of an election. So let's just first get this out of the way, elite and electoral democracy. Um, the moot point that I want to raise here is that the elite have failed democracy, one, by being very cynical about politics and politicians, and two, by not doing, and because this follows naturally from the first conversation that we were having here, not doing enough to think about electoral reforms and what kind yeah. of changes they might bring. And that's a very good, uh, good, good question. I just think it may not be in the best of taste because we have the elite here. I mean, so are and, we. I feel and, like that, no, that gives is, us a... And so but this is the good to, elite, you know. So, is, you know. <laughs> but self-flagellation in public is not in good taste. Mm. So with, with that sort of apology to the, our audience, I think that the original sin of our democracy is the fact that most Indians believe that somehow in 1947, the Constitution fell from the heavens from the sky. And because it <laughs> fell from the sky, they don't own it. And because I grew up as a child in the United States, I learned that the Americans, from right from your first grade in school, right through the university, make a great effort to educate the average American about, on, about citizenship, you know? And it's not just standing up for the flag in the cinema, but it is really about learning that what really democracy and what the American Constitution means. And I think Nehru tried. He gave countless speeches after independence and after we became a republic in 1950. Mm -hmm. But, and I heard one as a child yes, when my father was working at Bhakra Nangal. Oh, wow. You know, and he came to Bhakra Nangal to inaugurate. What an organic connection, you know, the yeah. temples of India and, and your father. Temples my of God, India. So. And so uh, the, the fact is that he, and I heard him as a child speaking at the inauguration. And you know, he did not make any impact mm -hmm. with the, this was engineers mm -hmm. that were there. And so Nehru was, I mean, Nehru had a very genuine, and, and, and you know, I, one can't help but love him. Mm -hmm. But the reality so is that he was, that, no, that he was a, he was a Western educated, 
intellectual, and he did not have the ability that Gandhi did to, to connect with India. Who also was a Western educated intellectual. Yes, but somehow Gandhi, but Gandhi was able to connect, you know, the same ideas that are in the Constitution, the, the uh, Enlightenment ideas of, uh, of liberty, of equality. Gandhi used to Fraternity. speak. Yeah, Gandhi used to present those ideas in the language of Sadharan Dharma, Correct. the way Buddha, the way actually Ashoka yes. did mm -hmm. with Dharma. Mm -hmm. And the same sense of, and he converted that language of the enlightenment of the constitution in, into Expression, a language yeah, that yeah. people understood. Yes, yes. It's too bad that Gandhi died right after independence. And so I feel that's the original sin, mm -hmm. that nobody has really sold the Constitution to our people. And therefore, the rule of law is a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel that, I mean, I had hoped maybe after Nehru, there would be another leader. Mm -hmm. Jai Prakash Narayan, one held the hope mm -hmm. that maybe Jai, he would be the one. But the f reality is, that we never had a person who, who did that. And, uh, and, and so th you talk about the elite only, but the whole country, including the elite, if, if what I learned in my American high school, everybody learns. You have got to sense, sense you get this, you have to get a sense of the responsibility mm -hmm. that you have as a citizen as a citizen to engage mm -hmm. i mean when i went to when i was an undergraduate at harvard mm -hmm. you know we were told the very first day we arrived that our responsibility was did not finish after 4 years of college our responsibility was after that and so that's why you had this sense of so many people who accepted jobs in washington because you were, it was ingrained in you. And I think if we could do that in our schools, you know, with the elite schools, Sriram School, Springdale's and Modern School and all the other good schools that we have, everybody, Doon School, everybody needs to learn that lesson, and which is a lesson in citizenship. And it's not that old civics class I'm talking about. So let me just close. By no, that's just, no, so uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I mean I have a lot of a slightly different uh, take on this. So it's wonderful that American schools teach uh, about constitution, you know, but it's also to be wondered, you know, that at the end of it they produce Trump, you know. So it has to be thought about. Uh, but no, I'm wait, not I, to think, be I think you're being unfair. Okay, no, so Trump I, I, is isn't Trump is an exception. I agree. I agree the, with you. Uh, the Amer you can't judge the American 250 years of I American agree with experience you. by Mr. Trump. I agree with you. And so but that's, a, that's to, a cheap shot. But I'm just going to nuance the argument a little bit. That you are right about the fact that you know in 1947 the Constitution came, and as Ambedkar kept reminding us, you know that political democracy means nothing without social democracy, without economic democracy, and he is he was the one who constantly kept flagging that. But having said that, there is a, a lot of merit to just, you know, the kind of political democracy that we have had in India and, and the idea of citizenship. It does not fall ready-made from heaven, as you're saying. It's a process, you know, people, because, you know, we live in a very, very unequal society. All societies are unequal, but our inequality takes a particular form of caste. So even within rich and poor, there's unequal access to not just education, not just to the resources, but also to life even within the village. So first, I would say that democratic processes in India do not begin in 1947. They actually begin in 1880s when the British begin local elections in India, you know, and even already in the 1880s, the British are looking at dismay at the mass Indian ability to master the electoral idiom and then to subvert it for their own ends, you know. So as early as 1910s and 1920s, there are rumors about, you know, Motilal Nehru who eats beef, therefore he should be defeated in this election. So this is something that goes back a very long time ago. 
1890s elections in northern India were fought on the issue of Gauraksha because there was a huge Gauraksha movement in the 1880s and 1890s. The same thing happened with the British courts, you know, when they first introduced the judiciary, Yashpal, the Hindi novelist in Jutha Such, looks back on the 1870s and 80s and, 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 and tries to recover how early the Indians were able to use the British courts and judicial system to file false claims of property and then to enmesh everybody in property claims. So there is a savviness. I'm not saying that, this, that, that Indians should have just been, you know, very respectful of British courts and only filed true cases, you know, as if anywhere in the world there are court systems where only true cases are filed, you know. So there is, there is, so I'm saying that between, nine, eight, uh, in, in between before 1947, there is a, about four or five decades of electoral practices that have existed in India. Those electoral practices then continue, the systems that have formed continue after 47. Even as a subversion, even if there is, you know, it's not the kind of democracy, for instance, that existed in Britain or in America, this democracy has been very useful in India. It has been useful in India because it has been an empowering phenomena. It has allowed, for instance, in the 60s, the first bust of, as we know, the, you know, the other backward classes that castes that come to power, you know. I know from my family, you know, the kind of words they still use from, from Mayavati, you know, is, is abhorrent, you know. This is even today I'm talking about. So the elites, uh, in, in terms of social elites, the caste elites were not willing to give spaces to people from non-forward castes. They had to rest it. And the democratic processes, you know, Charan, uh, Chaudhary, Charan Singh and the others that we love to dislike, are the pro people that use the democratic processes to empower their caste communities. And this process has been going on. So the question of citizenship and the question of respecting your constitution is, is, is a good idea, you know, but it's an idea that for a villager or for a rural person who feels completely marginalized, what is their stake in this system, in a system or in a democratic polity or in a society that has not allowed them equal access to education, that has discriminated against them. So why should they be interested in a constitution that does not seem to be giving them anything? But in fact, actually, uh, sorry. Sorry, sir. may I, sir, yeah. because we yeah. won't, I mean, I just, both of you have made wonderful points, but I can't help but feel that we're not really addressing, I mean, we're talking about how democracy has helped this country and so on and so forth, but the topic that we're um, tasked to sort of talk about is the role of the elite uh, where we, this we democracy... We had a little meeting, we yes, decided uh, <laughs> to, you know, to, to subvert the, the thing no, and you know, very, stick very, it in very our nice own... Of you. And you will henceforth prove how the elite... I, I, can, I can see what you're doing there forever, the great, uh, uh, you know, playwright, but um, I'll still persevere. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to quickly touch upon before moving on to, because both of you have raised points that I want to kind of bring up, particularly about democratic processes, but very quickly, you know, there was this time that you were talking about Gandhi, Nehru, so on and so forth. You know, these were people who were looked up to, the people at the Pakhtanangal Dam got his speech or not, of course, you know, there was a certain kind of reverence towards him, um, by and large, um, on average. Today, when we talk, the elite, for example, at least in the last couple of decades, the way the elite talk about politics is, you know, Gandhiji's hair politics and, you know, the politician in the Hindi film is that corrupt white kurta wearing man and so on and so forth. And this is sort of disdain about, towards politicians and, you know. And I can't help but think that, that that is an elitist perspective because these are people, they might be corrupt and so on and so forth, but they are talking about the poor. What do you think about that? Well, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to stereotype. And uh, it's, it's important to be able to see, it, it's very, you know, the word elite is a problematic word for me. Uh, because you're trying to get a whole lot. After all, what is elite? Mm -hmm. Elite is really a sense of, uh, it, it begins with a human need to feel superior over others. Every human being wants to feel superior over others. Now, of course, the problem in India is that need to feel superior over others was sanctioned mm -hmm. by religion into a caste system. So that was a, the, the, uh, the, the original sin, if you want to call the original sin. Homo hierarchicus, as Louis Dumont said. And, and so I, I, I really think that the, the, I, no, I the reason to go back into history is to be able to understand ourselves today. And he's a historian. So the, the reality is 
that in India, the state has always been weak and society has always been strong. And unlike China, which where the state was always strong and society was weak. In fact, what you need is a strong state to get things done and a strong society to make that state accountable. And the reason why it's difficult to do the kind of reforms of the state that we need to do, because that's really what we've been discussing, the whole electoral system, your discussion in the previous session with Naveen Chawla, and the reforms that we need to do. And really, it goes back to the fact that the, whether it's the elite or the non-elite, but the, our first, our first loyalty is to our society. And Nehru defined that very well when, you, when he was asked, what is society in India? And he said, it is the village, it's the family, joint family, and it's the caste. And so for us, India's history was a history of kingdoms, competing kingdoms. China's history was a history of empires. Mm -hmm. We had four empires in our history, the Maurya, the Gupta, the Mughal, and the British. All four empires were weaker. I was, were weaker than the weakest Chinese empire. So our Indian has, the Indian has always been defined by society. <laughs> the reason I mention all this, in fact, in India, oppression did not come from the state unlike China. Oppression came from society, from the Brahmins. And the people who were saviors were the, the Buddha, the gurus, the, the, the bhakti saints, and so on. And so I think ultimately what we are talking about is the reform of the state, the reform of governance. Why I was extolling China, the poor Chinese was not because he's wealthy now, mm -hmm. but because of the level of governance that is provided. And by governance, I mean the issue of why should it take 15 years to get justice in the courts? Mm -hmm. Why should a civil servant who works 14 hours a day and another civil servant who works one hour a day get promoted on the same day? Something is wrong with that. Why should the police be the handmaiden of the chief minister? You know? And, and why should we have criminals? One, 15%, he said, 30% is the number, but 15% serious crimes. Why do we have that? And why can't we fix that? That, I think, is ultimately, whether you're an elite or non-elite, is what the issue of the country is. And so, my, what I'm trying, I know you're getting a bit impatient, but the issue really is, Ultimately, it's, it comes down more than even economic reforms. We need the reforms, the governance reforms in the country. And that's, in fact, you may not like Margaret Thatcher, who's identified as an economic reformer, but Margaret Thatcher reformed the state. That whole yes minister culture mm -hmm. is the one she went with a hammer against. And, and that is really what we need in our country. Um, sorry, just uh, I, I want to talk about the reforms and, and where will they come from, but I'll, quickly, anything I'll, to I'll say answer. on yes, the... Yes, 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 yeah. I mean, so I keep getting, you know, because Mr. Mr. Das makes some wonderful points and then I, you know, I forget yes. your questions and I, you know, I remember what but, he said. But, you know, let's not I'll, do the I'll Vikram Betal thing. I'll go, I'll go back like to your it. question first, you know. So, so I think the problem, you know, yes, you know, so the disdain for politicians is, is, is very strong and very deep-rooted. And it's not a disdain that only the elites have. I think the middle class very strongly has that disdain and with very good reason because, you know, a middle class person who works hard, for instance, or, or with honesty, you know, he looks, you know, and, and he doesn't, he feels that he's being cheated or she's being cheated of, of what they deserve because the politicians are corrupt and they are delivering only to a handful of people. So Albert Pinto ko gussa 40 saal pehle aa raha tha, to wo bhi politicians pe aa raha tha. And Albert Pinto was by no means an elite person. So there is a problem, there is, you know, there is a disdain for politicians, there is a disdain for, that, that cuts across the elites to middle classes to a lot of people because politicians have come to become the epitome and representative of corruption. 
you know, short term, shortcut, making easy money. So everybody thinks, you know, politicians are, are wrong. The fact is that, you know, the civil servants, the bureaucrats, the IPS, they're all doing the same thing. You know, they're, you know, encounter specialist cops, you know, Daya Nayak was running a hundred crore education business, obviously, which his father didn't leave for him, you know. So, you know, the, 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 you know so everybody is complicit in these kinds of, of, of shortcuts, but politicians take the blame for that. But in a country where the state delivers only selectively to people, you know, the state is, is Mr. Das is absolutely right, there is, a, there is an issue of delivery mechanism. There are people, countries which have been able to pull their populations out of poverty. Korea has managed to do it to a certain extent. Malaysia has managed to do it. China, of course, has managed to do it. Taiwan, lots of countries have managed to pull their countries out of poverty without oil, as in the middle income countries. We've not been able to do it because our delivery systems are, are inefficient and they, they need reform, you know. Right. The government is not able to deliver. But at the end of the day, the only people who deliver to the poor are the government, you know. It's not, the, I mean, with full respect to Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble is not opening primary schools in villages in, you know, remote areas, in tribal areas, in Chhattisgarh or wherever UP. Perhaps the government should not do a lot of things that they are doing. I completely agree with that. But there are a lot of things that only government can do in India and government must do in India. And those are things that the government is doing. The government is doing those things in many cases because the politicians have a constituency to deliver to. Sometimes they don't do it, sometimes they are inefficient, but the people who are addressing even symbolically or even hypocritically the concerns of the poorest and the marginalized are not the, the, the middle class, are not the elites, are not the TV studios, but the, the politicians, you know. So politics, in a sense, is a, is a complex thing, but many times it's the, it's, it is actually the politician who talks about what needs to be, you know, what his constituents need. A lot of times the constituents, you see, we say that, you know, people should be very rational. So my friend Ravish Kumar does a television show saying, is chunao mein mudde nahi hai, logon ko sadak ke mudde ki baat karni chahiye, logon ko rozgar ki baat karni chahiye, log mudde ki baat nahi kar rahe hai, log aur cheezo ki baat kar rahe hai. Lekin mudda kya hai, wo to logon ko tay karna hai na. I completely disagree ki ye chunao mein mudda nahi, chunao mein mudda hi mudda hai. Wo mudda nahi hai, joh hum aur aap chahe rahe hai, par humare aapke chahene se thodi har admi apna mudda tay karega. They, people don't necessarily want politics because they should have more electricity in their, you know, super, you know, better power system in their house. They want politics, they want democracy as a certain expression of identity. And that identity is very important, you know. Politics is our hobby, just as, you know, cinema is our hobby. So why should we say, yaar, tumhari hobby is wrong, yaar, tum shatranj mat khela karo, tumhari hobby apni change kar leni chahiye. No, I'll say that. I'll say that because I'll qualify what I'm saying. I'm saying why we are so invested in party politics. हम लोगों में से बहुत से लोग बहुत depressed हैं यार 23 मई को क्या होने वाला है एकदम देश बर्बाद हो जाएगा। लेकिन 23 मई को कोई आए कोई जाए उस रेजिम चेंज से the vast majority of the poor will remain unaffected. आपके सब्जी वाला, आपका प्रेस वाला, आपका दूध वाला, आपके घर के नीचे की गंदगी आपके बिजली का मैकेनिज्म, आपका बीएसएनएल ऑफिस, आपका एमटीएनएल ऑफिस, आपका स्कूल, हर वो चीज जिससे एक मिडिल क्लास आदमी या एक गरीब आदमी का पाला पड़ता है, will remain completely unaffected by who comes to power on the 23rd May. But we are so invested कि 23rd May को क्या होने वाला है, because ये हमारा शौक है. This is our identity politics. You see, an identity politics is not a wasteful thing because human beings are not so rational ki yaar sirf rational cheez socho tumko apne bacche ke liye agar tumko usko liye school ki fees ke liye paise kamane to tum ye bhul jao yaar ki wo Deepika Padukone kaisa dance kar rahi thi. But people are not like that. No, people have to have that satisfaction as well. So I'm saying that, you know, it's not really a rational mechanism. Politics is an expression of a people's identity, their passions, and people are allowed to be passionate about things that don't immediately result in better roads and better power, you know. Why should we take that away from people? Okay, uh, just, I, I want to move on because otherwise we'll keep, uh, you know, circling around the same kind of topics. Both of you have talked about reforms, right? We've talked about electoral reforms in the previous session. You talked about, you know, uh, governance reforms and so on and so forth. And two things that are particularly important, which is, of course, the criminal justice system, rule of law, and inequality in systems of distribution and so on and so forth. We are saying that it is reform. Hum, I understand the trouble of, you know, trying to define elite and who's the elite, but, you know, even so, how can we sort of, as the elite, say that, you know, we have, no, this is not solely our responsibility because, you know, we have access to better education. We have, more than that, access to the pulpit. 
you know so if we are saying that reforms nahi hue hain then how can we claim that the elite are equally to blame than the rest of the country can we really well i think i mean frankly um, uh, pragya um, this is not really the issue the the issue ultimately you know you were talking about this election i mean 2014 the country had a sense of hope and 2019 that hope has disappeared and that's really the issue that we 2014 whether we were naive or whatever it was but there was a sense that we were going to go somewhere and today we are disillusioned and and uh, the 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 fact of the matter is the issues of the country are the issues of what well, the central issue to me and i touched on it earlier which is the issue of state capacity mm. you know we we think that m the country could would you know modi will become a dictator i don't think that is really as much the problem as the fact that in fact what we need is the opposite the issue is that we need greater state capacity the prime minister in india is actually much weaker than the st chief ministers of the state in some ways that's good because the delivery that we what affects our lives happens at the level of the state of the state chief ministers so the state chief minister and that's why we got enamored with modi because you know it gujarat he had really done something and we said he'd bring that and then he we, we realized that he was powerless he didn't do the kind of reforms that we wanted or perhaps he hadn't done that in gujarat maybe you know I'm well just, you no know, but just, that's i'm not i'm not saying yes or no i'm just saying perhaps yeah but you know you're taking you know let's not make okay. this into a mode i'm not, neither a modi hater nor a modi lover so let's not get into that the the question here is the central issue of the country and where the elite need to engage on is the whole you know as a, a, a liberal democracy stands on three pillars one it has to have an executive that can get the job done second it has to have a rule of law and the action of the executive has to be within the rule of law and third it has to have accountability so that it is accountable to the people that is the definition of a classical liberal democracy now we keep discussing all the time about accountability when the issue is the first one the issue of 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 delivery and that's why i when i was talking about china i was talking about the ability to deliver and so translating its will into into ground you know. on the ground level yeah, yeah. i'm talking about the poorest chinese yeah, yeah. person yeah. and so i what i'm trying to say here is that the it's going to be tough because india has never been a strong state it's been a strong society we need to have a respect for that state but ultimately what we need to do is to do is to enhance the capacity of the state in order to get things done and and so i'm sorry i'm not i may be subverting your mm. your your question but the whatever whoever whichever government comes to power on may 23rd the real issue will be the kind of reforms the judicial reforms the police reforms the reform i mean we talked about parliament you know when with navin patnaik there i mean navin uh, chawla, chawla yes. sorry navin if you are there but the the question really is these criminals mm. you know you put a fast track court six months you need no criminal six months for all people with criminal records and they must get uh, a decision by that time and i'll tell you not a single uh, corrupt not a single murderer will want to become a parliamentarian you want yeah. why the incentive to become a parliamentarian is to be able to delay his uh, you know 
the thing. Those are the real issues that matter to me. So with due respect, I, I, one second, I, Mehmood, if I may, um, I, I take your points very well, but I, I also wanted to go beyond uh, hope with Modi and disappointment from Modi and so on and so forth and talk about what we ourselves can do. So I just wanted to say, is there something that yes, we, yes, you yes, think, yes. can do? Yes, I, I, I don't know, just two or three things, you know. One, that, you know, ironically, sometimes it's the corrupt officer who actually delivers more on the ground, you know. This is an irony and a complexity that we have to understand, you know. Sometimes the honest bureaucrat is just too rule bound and is not willing to cure left or right. Sometimes it's the corrupt officer who is willing to go, you know, take this initiative and actually deliver on the ground. So that's a complexity. The state is not one thing. The state is many things. It's able to deliver to many of its constituents. You want to build a swanky new airport in Ghaziabad or wherever, it's going to be built. The state is going to be able to do it, you know. The road from the airport to your new friend's colony will be very well lit, you know. The state is able to deliver that. So the state is able to deliver different things sometimes. The state is not able to deliver uniformly to everybody. But this is not, the state can sometimes be bent to, to the will to deliver things, you know. Uh, the question that Mr. Das says, obviously the state must be made account, must be, made, must be reformed to be able to deliver to every poor person, regardless of their means. Right now the state can deliver to people with means, but not to the people without means, uh, 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 with, with complexities. But my question here is, you know, that expecting politics or every election asking, yaar, aapka MLA development karata hai ki nahi karata hai? Development kya matlab hai? Bijli sadak pani. MLA का बिजली की लाइन खींच के नहीं ला सकता क्योंकि उसके लिए आपका पूरा डिपार्टमेंट है जिसमें कोई 50,000 लोग एम्प्लॉयड हैं। It's a circle. It's done by the bureaucracy, controlled by the bureaucracy. There is five, you know, there is six or seven different departments which are involved in building roads. Nothing to do with the with, with the MLA. There are 10 or 12 officers on education sitting in every district on education, basic education officer, higher education officer, you know, whatever, medieval education officer, if you like, you know, but none of them are actually delivering, uh, you know, this is not the MLA's job. You should ask the MLA, ki aap apne ilake ki kitni shadiyon mein gaye Wo jata hai apne constituents ko. He's pleasing his constituents, he's doing that. I was talking to an MLA, he said, yaar, hum kya karein? Mere fast phone aata hai. कोई रेड लाइट पे बंदा खड़ा है कह रहा है ट्रैफिक वाले से उलझ रहा है यार मेरे को बचाओ मैं पूछता हूं ट्रैफिक वाले से क्या हुआ यार कह रहा भाई साहब बिना हेलमेट के गाड़ी जला रहा था वो कह रहा वो मेरा कांस्टिट्यूएंट है ही एक्सपेक्ट्स मी टू डू दिस फॉर हिम वो कह रहा जी मेरे चाचा के मामे के लड़के को नौकरी दिलाओ तो ये जो आपके एक्सपेक्टेशंस हैं अपने एमएलए से और अपने एमपी से वो इस तरह की हैं आप जब टीवी स्टूडियो में बैठते हो वहां डिबेट करते हो जी आपने कितना उसने डेवलपमेंट किया अरे भाई साहब वो कहां से डेवलपमेंट करेगा गोरखपुर का जो एमपी है उसके पास 5 करोड़ रुपए हैं उसके फंड में मैं कहता हूं 20 करोड़ रुपए हैं उसके फंड उसके पास डेवलपमेंट के गोरखपुर के एमपी के गोरखपुर डिस्ट्रिक्ट का बजट जो है वो 500 करोड़ कहां से वो 20 करोड़ का एमपी 500 करोड़ का डेवलपमेंट कर देगा यार यू आर जंपिंग अप द रॉन्ग ट्री आप बहस करते रहो हर इलेक्शन में कहां से वो करेगा यार यू हैव टू गो टू द स्टेट लेवल ऑफिसर एंड द ब्यूरोक्रेट ब्यूरोक्रेट टू आस्क हिम यार भाई साहब जो डिस्ट्रिक्ट जो आपका एजुकेशन ऑफिसर है जो इसका डिस्ट्रिक्ट डेवलपमेंट ऑफिसर है उससे जाके पूछो ना यार कि हमारे यहां आपने गांव में ये क्यों नहीं किया आप हर 5 साल में टीवी स्टोरी में बढ़ा के अरे पॉलिटिशियंस चोर हैं चोर हैं चोर हैं अरे भाई साहब आप जिसको कह रहे हैं आप आम की गुठली लगा के खड़े हैं देख रहे हैं यार पीपल का पेड़ नहीं निकल रहा है कैसे निकलेगा भाई ओके यू नो सो वी आर ऑलमोस्ट आउट ऑफ टाइम आई एम आई एम गोइंग टू टेक द लीवे ऑफ आस्किंग टू मोर क्वेश्चंस प्लीज वन इज यू नो यू सेड दैट टीवी स्टूडियो पे बैठ के लोग ये एंड ये बिल्कुल सही बात है कि हम ये पूछते हैं कि राहुल गांधी ने अमेठी में क्या डेवलपमेंट किया राहुल गांधी के पास अमेठी में भाई साहब 20 करोड़ रुपए हैं अमेठी का जो डिस्ट्रिक्ट मजिस्ट्रेट है ही सिट्स ऑन 10 टाइम्स हायर बजट एवरी ईयर राहुल गांधी क्या करेगा डीएम का कान पकड़ के खड़ा करके ले जाए चलो जी वहां स्कूल खुलवाओ इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल दिस इज नॉट द एमपीज जॉब दे आर लेजिस्लेटर्स they are legislators they sit in parliament and assembly to legislate we should make them do that job <coughs> they should discuss policy we should make parliamentary committees more effective agar hamari parliamentary just mr das knows very well am jo us congress ka jo power hai hamari parliamentary committees bhi powerful hain but they don't do that job that's their job their job is to make bureaucrats and ministries more accountable so the financial audit you know committee in parliament jo defense committee hai parliament ki जो एजुकेशन कमेटी है पार्लियामेंट की आप उसको बोलो कि यार आप अपना काम क्यों नहीं कर रहे हो वो ये नहीं कर सकता आई एम सॉरी टू कट यू बट आई एक्चुअली डू वांट टू आस्क टू मोर क्वेश्चंस आई वाज गेटिंग टू माय क्वेश्चन व्हिच इज अब मैं बोलूंगा ही नहीं नहीं आप प्लीज बोले व्हिच द क्वेश्चन इज कि देखिए आप जो कह रहे हैं वो सही है बिल्कुल सही है कि हम किस मापदंड पर हम अपने एमपी को या एमएलए को सेलेक्ट करते हैं ठीक है फैजाबाद घूम के आई है वहां सब वोटर्स का जायजा लेके इसलिए इतनी अच्छी हिंदी बोल रही है देख ले 
तो बट हियर अगेन कमिंग बैक टू दिलीट टी वी स्टूडियो में तो हम ही लोग बैठते हैं आप ना बैठते हो हम ना बैठते हो लेकिन हम में से कई बैठते हैं ठीक है हम जैसे लोग बैठते हैं हम लोगों को बुलाया गया है जब द क्वेश्चन इज दैट यू नो नॉट ओनली आर वी सिटिंग इन टी वी स्टूडियोज वी आर एंड आई एम द आयरन इज लॉस्ट नॉट लॉस्ट ऑन मी दैट वी आर ऑल्सो सिटिंग हियर इन डिबेटिंग एलीट एंड ऑल ऑल ऑफ आस आर एलीट इन फैक्ट बट द क्वेश्चन आई वॉन्ट टू आस्क इज कि जब एलीट के पास पल्पिट है जब उनके पास दे आर कंट्रोलिंग टू अ लार्ज एक्सटेंट द मीडिया uh the cultural institutions let's assume they are if they are controlling uh these uh, uh sort of channels of information uh what is incumbent upon them what you know are they supposed to i mean would we blame ourselves for not putting out the correct information on how to think about uh elections and who to elect would we think about making these institutions more elective i mean today also dalit representation in media is abysmal and one of the things you hear from the right wing constantly is that they don't their voices don't get heard and haven't gotten heard in cultural institutions and media forever what views would you have on that so i think the the really the the issue here is not the issue of blaming the elite or or the people in the cultural studios or even the politicians the question really boils down to the fact that the 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 problems of india are not the problems of the what they are the problems of the how how to solve the problem we all know the problems the indians in the indian is the argumentative indian we have 25 opinions on every subject it is the issue of actually implementation and that's why i keep coming back to state capacity but also intent sir I mean. well yes i don't think with this bad intention i think whether you are the elite or the non elite and whether your heart bleeds for the poor or doesn't heart bleed for the poor but the issues of the which will solve the problems you see what makes a reason i come back to china is not because i like authoritarianism i wouldn't want to be chinese but the question what china delivered was the fact that this amazing bunch of the same kind of bureaucrats that we had they were actually able to deliver can i just ask before 77 or after 77 i'm talking about after 77 for me deng is the real so the 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 question now is that and i'm not sure what role your question was what role can the elite play the elite the role the elite can play is to be engaged with politics and the engagement it doesn't end with being a, watching a television show but the engagement really is with the kind of engagement i was talking about earlier that you sense a sense of responsibility not just to vote but you know the amazing thing about them um, the, the, the uh, you may not like america but the amazing thing about americans i, I love america actually. the the uh, amazing I thing get, i get paid a lot of money for my shows there you know so. but the amazing thing about the americans which tocqueville yes, found yes, yes, in yes, the yes, great yes. book Absolutely. democracy in america the greatest book yeah. written about america was the americans he said at the local level are joiners mm -hmm. meaning that they will spend their friday evening going from house to house canvassing for this or that they have a local you know boys club girls scouts uh, bowling league uh, bridge club whatever but they are engaged in their communities and so what one can learn from that is that sense and therefore that engagement then goes to the point where you have somebody like governor rockefeller mm. who was actually a, a liberal republican mm. that species has vanished mm. in america but those people felt that was a sense of duty mm. to actually run for an election they may lose the first time they may lose the second time but they would persist and that sense of uh, honor and what i said was that from class 1 grade 1 <laughs> you start learning that sense mm. and that's pride in your institutions and and so i personally think 
that's where. Can I add one bit about my admiration for American democracy? I think American democracy is, is, is phenomenal because, you know, there is an incredible amount of civil society monitoring of government spending. What is, you know, the Louisiana governor spending on health? What is the Louisiana, uh, 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 you know, con Congress? How much attention it is paid to health? How much attention it is paid to education? The immigration, any, any topic that you look at, you will find that there are independent research groups who are full-time engaged in monitoring government activity, in monitoring social activity, social spending. So that layer between the governors and the voters in America is very dense with activists, with researchers, with policy groups, right. with people who are doing phenomenal amounts of so data collection. That's what they call social capital. Yes. yes. And, and that's something we can certainly learn. Uh, learn, learn, learn. Things, things like what India Spend is doing, for instance, here, you know, there's, there's, there's one India Spend here, there's probably, you know, 20 India Spends in every state in America. You know. Okay, I did have one more question, but I don't think we have time for it. Uh, perhaps next time I'll get the opportunity to ask you guys what you think about um, elite engagement with uh, secularism and liberalism. But for now, I'll let you go and have your drinks. Thank you very much for being patient.